Today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about shared decision making and Hodgkin and Palmer. And these are my disclosures. The data that I'm going to share with you today comes from three different uh, studies that we conducted over the past year or so uh, with Hodgkin survivors who are all currently adults, although may have been diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma uh, at any point over the age of 12. Uh, there are three different studies uh, from which a national sample was drawn in about 300 patients. Today, I'd like to talk to you about these, these specific questions. One is to understand together what decisions need to be made and when, who can participate in decision-making and what is shared about decision-making. And I think the most important thing we've learned from all of the people who have participated in our studies is one size does not fit all. There are many decisions that need to be made um, and that part begins with the at the time of diagnosis. It's important to understand which partners can be included in the decision-making process, and then the range of decisions that need to be considered, including goals of care, selection of therapy, site of care, which is where the care will actually take place, the cost of care, and then other considerations. In terms of partners that can be included in the decision-making, this is really up to the patient. Um, does the patient want to go into the decision-making process alone with provider, with family member or um, significant other, or, uh, or other people um, brought in and some combination thereof? In terms of goals of care, the issue has to do with whether or not this is um, going for cure or going for comfort or some combination thereof. In terms of the selection of therapy, what are the options and how does one learn about those different options given the disease and uh, individual person's characteristics? For example, does the patient want to be tr treated on a clinical trial? And is a clinical trial available and appropriate given the disease context? What is the standard of care and what does that even mean? Does the patient want to receive chemotherapy alone? And if so, what combination of chemotherapy? If radiation is used, what are the options? What are the types? And what are the size of radiation fields that could be considered? If response adapted therapy is selected, well, again, what does that mean? And how will therapy change based on the response to treatment partway through? What is the length of treatment? meaning how many cycles will be given over how long, assuming of course that the patient can tolerate the therapy that's being given. And then what are the acute and long-term effects of that therapy? What should the patient be on the lookout for during active treatment and then once um, treatment has been completed? What is the preferred setting for the treatment, meaning in the community or at an academic medical center that may be, um, may be close by, but may also be uh, much further away from one's home. For those people who are diagnosed at what we'll call the, the crossover ages between pediatric-based and adult-based care, which typically happens in the late teens and early 20s, would the pediatric or the adult facility be the preferred setting? In terms of cost of care, what things might and might not be covered by insurance or out-of-pocket expenses and how can one plan for that? In our national survey, we found, for example, that 80% of respondents 
thought that short and long-term considerations were very important to understand at the time of the initial decision. About two thirds of the respondents also endorsed the, import the importance of treatment setting. And interestingly, about half noted dis distance from home to be important and a third indicated that cost of care would be important. So again, you see lots of variation even among these three different samples. So let's talk about the decision makers, the patient, the provider, family members, including parents, siblings, um, significant others, spouses, um, and then other friends or other supports. What we found in one of our surveys was that survivors identified parents, spouses, um, and in about half the cases, other family members in only about 20% of cases. And then interestingly, 13% saying that they went to that discussion alone. Uh, so it would just be the patient and provider. In terms of who made the decision, given that variation in who was at the discussion, patients reported that about a quarter thought that the patient and doctor made the decision together. Another quarter thought that the doctor made the decision alone. And then an, another quarter responded by saying that the patient, doctor, and other family members all participated. In 15% of cases, the patient herself identified that she alone made the decision about her treatment. There are some examples of different styles of decision-making. Some refer to themselves as active decision-makers, meaning that they fully participated in the choice of therapy whereas others thought of themselves as more passive, kind of going along with what the recommendations were. In the terms of the breakdown from the 300 plus survivors we spoke with, about a third described themselves as passive. About a quarter described themselves as more active and 12 said maybe it was a combination. And these are some illustrative quotes to help give you a flavor for what we were hearing. In terms of deference to a provider or a parent, I, I one 26 year old um, at the time of the survey, or pardon me, at the time of diagnosis said, I wouldn't have known what to decide. I knew I had a choice, but it was like, this is what we suggest. And I'm like, okay, they're the experts. Another said, I feel like I was really naive. You know, I didn't really question. I just took whatever they said as fact and didn't question it at all. These are examples of passive decision makers. One of the other issues in addition to decision-making style is what perceptions are of options. Do people feel like they have a choice? And um, to what extent do they have to bring the knowledge base to that discussion or it, can they get that kind of education at the time of uh, the initial discussion? About half of our people we uh, spoke with felt that the plan was a shared decision with their provider as opposed to um, being told what to do. Treatment goals vary um, perhaps by age. And this, these are the results from a recent sample that we, uh, a recent survey we conducted in about 200 um, patients nationwide. And what you can see is, and you compare respondents who were less than 40 in the darker green bar in the middle of your, versus older patients at the time of diagnosis in this um, brighter green, you can see that the goals of care at the time of diagnosis were much more um, in favor of aggressive treatment at the time of diagnosis for younger patients 
than for um, older patients, 80 versus 60. Um, interestingly, also a willingness to make different kinds of trade-offs, 93% among younger patients versus 71% in, in the slightly older patients. But much less willingness in, in both age groups to um, accept long-term risks in exchange for therapy that might work better in the long term. So again, different goals of care initially, and also um, different trade-offs or, or preferences um, in both the short-term and in the long-term. In this slide, we look at the topics that were discussed at the time of initial diagnosis. And, and this is a little bit hard to read, so I'll walk you through this. But you can see in, the, on, in this panel, um, this is patients' recollections of what was discussed at the time of the initial diagnosis. And you can see uh, a whole range of uh, short-term um, side effects of therapy were discussed, as well as some of the longer-term effects. And, and this is compared then with patient concerns that they recall having at the time of that discussion. So for example, regardless of age, patients recall hearing about some of the acute side effects such as nausea and vomiting, hair loss, fatigue, et cetera. Longer term effects, um, there was somewhat of a difference. Um, this is the risk of second cancers, where you can see more younger people recall that discussion than older patients. And whereas the older patients had a stronger recollection of hearing more about risks of heart disease or stroke. Infertility was a topic that was recalled by, by the majority of younger patients and um, obviously not discussed to the same extent or not recalled to the same extent among older patients. Patients' concerns at the time of this initial discussion ranged pretty substantially, where again, second cancer was something that, that patients were concerned about, heart disease and stroke, something that older patients were more likely to be worried about, infections and lung disease more commonly for the older patients as well. This is another representative quote that I thought was really quite uh, remarkable, which is a young man 18 to 25 at the time of diagnosis said that he, I think I asked when we started that when I think I asked, when would we start noticing a sort of decrease in the tumor? And then I wanted to know if this doesn't work, what are some of the other options for treatment? So understanding side effects, understanding late effects, but also wanting to understand when are we gonna know whether this initial treatment is actually working? In terms of long-term outcomes, in, in, term, the, in addition to those I just mentioned, it's really important that patients and their families understand the language um, of this decision-making. So if a physician said you want to avoid late effects, your question might be, what is a late effect? What does it even mean? And how is that different than a side effect? which might be something that you experience early on in response to treatment. Which ones are relevant given the treatment you're receiving and over what time frame are you at risk for that to occur? Is this something that might occur shortly after the, uh, the completion of treatment such as thyroid disease or something that might occur many, many years later such as a second cancer or damage to the heart? These two illustrative quotes help frame that part of the discussion. I don't think I had a concept about what a late effect was. I thought you were diagnosed with cancer and then you either died from it or you didn't. So it was the, the diagnosis was essentially all that you needed to focus on. Another survivor said, 
I didn't really know that I was at risk for breast cancer until they found a small cyst before I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And this coming from a young woman diagnosed um, in the 18 to 25 year age group. And I should be uh, clear with you that we reported um, these quotes in age ranges rather than specific ages to uh, protect the privacy of those uh, individuals who participated in our study. When should late effects be discussed? Well, there's a range of opinion on that as well. Uh, from our surveys, we learned that some people wanted to hear about it at the time of diagnosis when they were making their initial, uh, initial treatment decision. In retrospect, one person said, I probably should have heard um, about late effects before treatment even started. I should have asked more questions. I should have had people tell me more. Other people didn't agree and said, at the time of diagnosis, I just didn't care. I didn't care that is about late effects. I just wanted to get the treatment. I wanted to get rid of the disease. It wouldn't really have made a difference in my treatment decision-making process. So I think later on, I probably would have been able to absorb it better. And what about waiting until those late effects began to emerge? Well, that has its problems as reported by this young man. I didn't expect within five years of finishing my treatment at the age of 26, having to start taking heart medication probably for the rest of my life. He advised that it would probably have been worth hearing about that before the event actually occurred. For patients who are within the, um, the fertile years or want to consider family formation and family planning, uh, discussions about fertility also have a very important uh, time sensitivity. But when should these discussions occur? And with which specific people, uh, which patients are more at risk or for which people are these, is this the most relevant? Most um, clinicians believe that fertility discussion should occur prior to the onset of treatment to optimize the most success in, um, in fertility preservation. But it's important that the medical situation is stable enough to endure any delays. If someone has, for example, a large mediastinal mass and is having compromise to their breathing or to their heart functioning, it may not be possible to um, tolerate a delay for fertility preservation, but in many cases it can be tolerated um, and would be encouraged. There are very different considerations, and I know this is a whole separate talk in and of itself, but there are many different considerations for male versus female fertility preservation in terms of how much time it takes the complexity of the process and also the cost, cost of both the collection and the storage. Cost of uh, fertility preservation and sperm banking, for example, um, vary considerably. Um, and un unlike many other countries, uh, many of our commercial insurance uh, does not cover this, um, these costs. So in conclusion, across three different studies and, and about 300 survivors, we learned a lot about the treatment decision-making process. And overall, people were satisfied with um, the decision-making uh, they made at the time of initial diagnosis. Interestingly, a sizable portion of patients expressed remarkable information gap about future health risks, uh, even though they do recall the provider mentioning some of these things at the time of initial diagnosis. I think that a lack of, of full or robust knowledge of uh, what the future may hold may translate to less adherence to survivorship surveillance recommendations because people may not have a context for why this is being recommended. Additionally, while cure is 
may be the most important factor for most survivors at the time of initial diagnosis. Many would have preferred to hear more about late effects at, the, um, at, at that time, and certainly by the time that they completed therapy, which is roughly six to nine months in duration. One of the very important things about all of this is that our landscape in terms of the treatment of Hodgkin's disease is changing dramatically. We have novel therapy, including immuno-oncologic therapy, dramatic changes to the delivery of radiation therapy, different techniques, different size of radiation fields that necessitates updated and ongoing discussions between patients and providers. We don't have full knowledge yet about the long-term side effects of some of our novel therapies. So as that knowledge emerges, we need to continually update our patients to make sure that they are aware of what their future health risks may be. I would be happy to take any questions that you have at this time.